way. So what I want us to think about is how are we created, how are we designed on the inside, how do we function? The stoic <coughs> understanding of the human. This is what you have been probably trained with your whole life without ever even questioning it uh, or even having it laid out. Just that we have a mind, we have a, so uh, sorry, a mind, a, uh, a heart and uh, a decision-making will and they're in this committee meeting and there's this kind of dialogue going on, could be a bit of an arm wrestle, uh, but ultimately you don't want to trust the feelings too much, you want to make good decisions. Does, does this ring any bells? You come across this? Maybe your parents have said something like, I don't care if you want to clean your room. You do the right thing and your feelings will follow. Right now, where does this model come from? I said it's stoic, but what, what in the world's that? It's, it's basically coming from um, a couple of things. One, their view of God, and two, their view of humans. Okay, so a little bit of history of what God's like from a Greek perspective. Before you come to the philosophers, you've got the Greek mythology. You know the Greek gods? They were kind of, they were sort of super beings with hormones that were out of control. You know, so Greek god is walking down the street, sees beautiful woman, loses control. And it was quite embarrassing. And so by the time you get down to the philosophers, uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, they're saying, no, no, no. If there is any super being, ultimate being, it cannot be like them. So it's a real pendulum swing, all right? So all history tends to be pendulum swings. So their view was God, the divine, has to be distinct from that. And that was just kind of very human. So there's a, a divide between us and God, which we'll think about in a second. But essentially, what's God like? Well, he is, he is the unmoved mover, right? So emotion is about being moved. It's about being responsive to things, right? The things stimulate and excite and depress and encourage and discourage and make you happy and make you sad. The divine is unmoved, right? So God is pure mind and will. Unhindered by pesky emotions, he will process information perfectly because he has the greatest brain. I'm saying he, philosophers would say it. Right, does that sound like Mr. Spock? Do you remember the old Star Trek thing? Uh, basically, if you're stuck in a celestial cul-de-sac somewhere and you're Klingons on the starboard bow or something, you're in trouble. You want Mr. Spock to get you out, right? He's the one. He can rescue you. What was the deal with Spock and the Vulcans? They had no, right? They had no emotions, <laughs> right? And so, so that was a perfect solution, right? And so what the philosophers have pushed for, and actually this has been brought into Christianity for the past... 800 years especially, kind of a long history. This has been brought in, the idea is that we are, well, we're responsible agents. We need to be responsible before God. God, in whose image we are made, is pure mind and will. And we, made in his image, need to suppress the affections. Therefore, what does it mean to be a good Christian? Well, good information, good discipline. Tracking with that? So what, what are the keys to, uh, to Christian spirituality according to this way of thinking? Christianity equals do the right thing. Responsibility. Right, now, if, if God is pure mind and will, and we are mind and will, but with pesky affections that we should do, you know, do well to suppress, at what point do we connect with God? Is it heart to heart, mind to mind, will to will? Like mind to mind. So therefore, what do we have in the Bible? God's mind, the mind of Christ. What do we have in ourselves? A mind that needs to be renewed. What's the alternative? If I'm, I'm, in, I'm, I'm trying to be dispassionate, <laughs> see that? I'm trying to be uh, objective and, and present this in such a way that uh, you know a, a stoic amongst us would say amen that's fantastic I'm struggling because I just don't get this I don't see this even though I see it all over Christianity but I don't see it all over scripture what we actually have I think biblically and I'll show you where in a second um, but also you can chase this historically as well Augustine's view of, of the human 
is quite distinct from the previous version. The previous version was a committee with one unwelcome member. Okay, it's there, but you kind of want to keep them quiet. This is not a committee. There's not much discussion that goes on here. You tell me, can you think of anywhere biblically where the heart is presented as being the source of decisions, the source of life, the source of the stuff of life? Any, any heart references biblically that come to mind? Heart first. Yeah. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Strength seems to be more will related. Heart, more heart related, yeah? So that comes up once or twice. Olivia? Um, Proverbs, it says, um, guard your heart because it's the worst thing in the world. Mm. And at the start of that verse, above all else, <laughs> yeah. above all else, imagine that in a book like Proverbs. You know, just t hundreds, thousands of, of nuggets of wisdom. Above all else makes you want us to listen. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Okay, so uh, that's Proverbs 4.23, if you're taking notes. Any other references? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, who said that? Jesus. Okay, so he knew a thing or two. So. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12. Anyone remember what it says in, Ma in Mark 7? Jesus having this dispute with the Pharisees. And you remember what he said? He said, it's not what goes into the... To the stomach, that just gets into the stomach and is expelled. It's quite graphic. That's not what, where sin comes from. Where does sin come from? Sin comes from the heart, from within. Out of the heart pours forth, and then he lists all this stuff, sexual immorality and impurity and all. It's, it's a belch from the heart. That's Jesus paraphrased. There's one more passage that I think is worth noticing in Ephesians 4. Okay, so Ephesians 4, 17, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. What does that mean? Walk as the Gentiles do. It probably doesn't mean, you know, kind of you know, dragging their heels and, you know, kind of one-sided. He's talking about the stuff of life, right? The decisions, the lifestyle, the, the direction. But it's kind of the... It's kind of like, right, it's the decisions that are made, the way you live, the, the evidence. He's saying, that don't, don't go there. Don't be like them. And then he explains why they are like they are. They are, notice these three comments. Futility of their minds, darkened in understanding, uh, ignorance in them. What do those three things have in common? They're all mind, right? So that's all. So why do they walk as they do? Because of the way they think. People do what they do because of the way they think, right? But then he doesn't, that's not the end of the sentence. Verse 18 at the end, due to their hardness of heart. Bam. End of the sentence. Why do they think the way they think and therefore do the things they do, live the way they live? It's because of the heart. You see that? It's, it's not just educate. You see, this is our, our issue. We think if we can just educate, then good decisions will be made. Or even, if we can just practice doing good things, then good will come of it. How much do we see of that in the church? Just do the right thing. Do the right thing. And we do this kind of socialize people into being Christian. It doesn't work. Or, or we say, well, okay, let's go a step further. Let's get sophisticated. Let's educate. And so you get people coming out of Bible school, going into pastorates, thinking, well, I didn't get a job in a Bible school, but I can at least do a mini version here. And it becomes an educate ministry. I think if I just educate people, if only they could understand this, if they just understand this, and if we apply some social pressure, they'll be good Christians. But it's ignoring the fact that it's due to the hardness of heart. It's the heart that's the issue. The heart is the wellspring of life. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, pour forth all sins. You know, and on it goes. First of all, there's no committee going on inside this understanding. It's one direction. And it starts back there and it heads this way. That gives us a problem. Previous model that we had up here, the committee of three with one unwelcome, the reason that person was unwelcome was because you can't trust them. You can't trust your emotions. You can't trust the affections. You can be moved. You, know, you can watch a movie and start weeping when you don't want to. Ugh, so annoying, especially if you're the bloke on the date. <laughs> no, I'm fine, fine. You know, we, we don't like the uh, sort of the the sense of not being in control, not being independent, self-moved individuals. 
And so that's a problem. What does the heart do? Here's the, the key issue in terms of the heart. But it's, it's the gateway. We're designed to be responders. What drives us is our response. It's not our responsibility. We don't rationally think things through and come up with good decisions. We, we may think we do, we may tell ourselves we do. The reality is we will always process based on what we love. And what we love is a response. It's not something we self-generate. And we're either responsive to the world and the flesh and the devil and you know the signals that come in, or we're responsive to the love of Christ. And based on who we love, we'll determine how we think. We'll determine what we do. You ever done youth ministry? This is like the ultimate proof for the second view. All right, so youth ministry caricature, are you ready? You're, imagine you're a youth leader, and you've got this group of youth, and you care about them, you love them, you want them to succeed as Christians. What's your greatest fear? Dating a non-Christian. Right? Because you know from experience, maybe even your own, you know that if they go after a non-Christian, it's going to be a downward spiral. Yeah? And so what do youth ministries often do? They talk about dating non-Christians. And what do they do? They inform. Here's a verse, folks, we're back to our six weekly cycle, back to why we're not going to date non-Christians. And you come out with your verses and you educate, educate. That's not enough. So then you do the group peer pressure thing, right? So, do we all agree that we're not going to date a non-Christian? On the count of three. One, two, three. No, no, no. But, <laughs> so there's group pressure combined with lots of information because you know if they date a non-Christian, bam, you lose them. They drift. And then what happens? Your star youth <coughs> member comes to you one Sunday and says, <laughs> I want to tell you something. And you go, oh, what's up? Well, I kind of met somebody. Oh, right. Tell me more. And they start telling you and you start thinking, hang on a minute. Uh, so are they Christian? And they go, yeah, yeah, well, kind of. And then comes this explanation. They rationalize. We're heart-driven creatures. The alternative to kind of being tossed every which way by random feelings is not to, be cut, to say, no, we're actually clear thinking, rational, self-determined creatures. No, we, we make decisions always based on what we love. It's a God who from the heart has sent his son to die for us. It's a God who from the heart welcomes us into his family who says, I love you and I like you and I want you to be mine. That's an amazing God. And I think that's the God of the Bible. And if that's the God of the Bible, what does it mean for us to be Christians made in his image? Well, it, it, it means engaging fully from the heart in the relationship that he's invited us to.